This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Eugenics and Other Evils by G. K. Chesterton Section 11 Part 2 The Real Aim Chapter 3 True History of a Eugenist he does not live in a dark, lonely tower by the sea, from which are heard the screams of vivisected men and women. On the contrary, he lives in Mayfair. He does not wear great goblin spectacles that magnify his eyes to moons or diminish his neighbors to beetles. When he is more dignified, he wears single eyeglass. When he is more intelligent, a wink. He is not indeed wholly without interest in heredity, and eugenical biology, but his studies and experiments in this science have specialized almost exclusively in equus cellar, the rapid or running horse. He is not a doctor, though he employs doctors to work up a case for eugenics, just as he employs doctors to correct the errors of his dinner. He is not a lawyer, though unfortunately often a magistrate. He is not an author or a journalist though he not infrequently owns a newspaper. He is not a soldier, though he may have commission in the yeomanry. Nor is he generally a gentleman, though oftener a nobleman. His wealth now commonly comes from a large staff of employed persons who scurry about in big buildings while he is playing golf. But he very often laid the foundations of his fortune in a very curious and poetical way the nature of which I have never fully understood. It consisted in his walking about the street without a hat and going up to another man and saying, Suppose I have two hundred whales out of the North Sea. To which the other man replied, And let us imagine that I am in possession of two thousand elephant tusks. They then exchange. And the first man goes up to a third man and says, Supposing me to have lately come into the possession of two thousand elephant tusks, would you, etc., etc. If you play this game well, you become very rich. If you play it badly, you have to kill yourself, or try your luck at the bar. The man I am speaking about must have played it well, or at any rate successfully. He was born about 1860, and he has been a member of Parliament since about 1890. For the first half of his life he was a liberal. For the second half he has been a conservative. But his actual policy in Parliament has remained largely unchanged and consistent. His policy in Parliament is as follows. He takes a seat in a room down at Westminster and takes from his breast pocket an excellent cigar case, from which in turn he takes an excellent cigar. This he lights up and converses with other owners of such cigars, an equus cellar, or such matters as may afford him entertainment. Two or three times in the afternoon a bell rings, whereupon he deposits the cigar in an ashtray with a great particularity, taking care not to break the ash, and proceeds to an upstairs room flanked with two passages. He then walks into whichever of the two passages shall be indicated to him by a young man of the upper classes, holding a slip of paper. Having gone into this passage, he comes out of it again, is counted by the young man, and proceeds downstairs again, where he takes up the cigar once more, being careful not to break the ash. This process, which is known as representative government, has never called for any great variety in the manner of his life. Nevertheless, while his parliamentary policy is unchanged, his change from one side of the house to the other did correspond with a certain change in his general policy in commerce and social life. The change of the party label is by this time quite a trifling matter. But there was in his case a change of philosophy, or at least the change of project, though it was not so much becoming a Tory as becoming rather the wrong kind of socialist. He is a man with a history. It is a sad history, for he is certainly a less good man than he was when he started. 
That is why he is the man who is really behind eugenics. It is because he has degenerated that he has come to talking of degeneration. In his radical days, to quote from one who corresponded in some ways to this type, he was a much better man, because he was a much less enlightened one. The hard impudence of his first Manchester individualism was softened by two relatively humane qualities. The first was a much greater manliness in his pride, the second was a much greater sincerity in his optimism. For the first point, the modern capitalist is merely industrial. But this man was also industrious. He was proud of hard work. Nay, he was even proud of low work if he could speak of it in the past and not the present. In fact, he invented a new kind of Victorian snobbishness, an inverted snobbishness. While the snobs of Thackeray turned Muggins into De Morgans, while the snobs of Dickens wrote letters describing themselves as officers' daughters accustomed to every luxury except spelling, the individualist spent his life in hiding his prosperous parents. He was more like an American plutocrat when he began but has since lost the American simplicity. The Frenchman works until he can play. The American works until he can't play, and then thanks the devil, his master, that he is donkey enough to die in harness. But the Englishman, as he has since become, works until he can pretend that he never worked at all. He becomes, as far as possible, another person, a country gentleman who has never heard of his shop, one whose left hand holding a gun knows not what his right hand doeth in a ledger. He uses peerage as an alias and a large estate as a sort of alibi. A stern Scotch minister remarked concerning the same of golf with a terrible solemnity of manner. The man who plays golf, he neglects his business, he forsakes his wife, he forgets his god. He did not seem to realize that it is the chief aim of many a modern capitalist life, to forget all three. This abandonment of boyish vanity in work, this substitution of a senile vanity in indolence, this is the first respect in which the rich Englishman has fallen. He was more of a man when he was at least a master workman and not merely a master. And the second important respect in which he was better at the beginning is this, that he did then in some hazy way half believe that he was enriching other people as well as himself. The optimism of the early Victorian individual was not wholly hypocritical. Some of the clearest-headed and blackest-hearted of them, such as Malthus, saw where things were going and boldly based their Manchester city on pessimism instead of optimism. But this was not the general case. Most of the decent rich of the Bright and Cobden sort did have a kind of confused faith that the economic conflict would work well in the long run for everybody. They thought the troubles of the poor were incurable by state action. They thought that of all troubles. But they did not cold-bloodedly contemplate the prospect of those troubles growing worse and worse. By one of those tricks or illusions of the brain to which the luxurious are subject in all ages, they sometimes seem to feel as if the populace had triumphed symbolically in their own persons. They blasphemously thought about their thrones of gold, what can only be said about a cross, that they being lifted up would draw all men after them. They were so full of the romance that anybody could be Lord Mayor, that they seemed to have slipped into thinking that everybody could. It seemed as if a hundred Dick Whittingtons, accompanied by a hundred cats, could all be accommodated at the mansion house. It was all nonsense, but it was not, until later, humbug. Step by step, however, with a horrid and increasing clearness, this man discovered what he was doing. It is generally one of the worst discoveries a man can make. 
at the beginning the british plutocrat was probably quite as honest in suggesting that every tramp carried a magic cat like dick whittington as the bonapartist patriot was in saying that every french soldier carried a marshal's baton in his knapsack but it is exactly here that the difference and the danger appears there is no comparison between a well-managed thing like napoleon's army and an unmanageable thing like modern competition logically doubtless it was impossible that every soldier should carry a marshal's baton they could not all be marshals any more than they could all be mayors but if the french soldier did not always have a baton in his knapsack he always had a knapsack but when that self-helper who bore the adorable name of smiles told the english tramp that he carried a coronet in his bundle the english tramp had an unanswerable answer he pointed out that he had no bundle the powers that ruled him had not fitted him with a knapsack any more than they had fitted him with a future or even a present the destitute englishman so far from hoping to become anything had never been allowed even to be anything the french soldier's ambition may have been in practice not only a short but even a deliberately shortened ladder in which the top rungs were knocked out but for the english it was the bottom rungs that were knocked out so that they could not even begin to climb and sooner or later in exact proportion to his intelligence the english plutocrat began to understand not only that the poor were impotent but that their impotence had been his only power the truth was not merely that his riches had left them poor it was that nothing but their poverty could have been strong enough to make him rich it is this paradox as we shall see that creates the curious difference between him and every other kind of robber i think it is no more than justice to him to say that the knowledge where it has come to him has come to him slowly and i think it came as most things of common sense come rather vaguely and as in a vision that is by the mere look of things the old cobdenite employer was quite within his rights in arguing that earth is not heaven that the best obtainable arrangement might contain many necessary evils and that liverpool and belfast might be growing more prosperous as a whole in spite of pathetic things that might be seen there but i simply do not believe he has been able to look at liverpool and belfast and continue to think this that is why he has turned himself into a sham country gentleman earth is not heaven but the nearest we can get to heaven ought not to look like hell and liverpool and belfast look like hell whether they are or not such cities might be growing prosperous as a whole though a few citizens were more miserable but it was more and more broadly apparent that it was exactly and precisely as a whole that they were not growing more prosperous but only the few citizens who were growing more prosperous by their increasing misery you could not say a country was becoming a white man's country when there were more and more black men in it every day you could not say a community was more and more masculine when it was producing more and more women nor can you say that a city is growing richer and richer when more and more of its inhabitants are very poor men there might be a false agitation founded on the paths of individual cases in a community pretty normal in bulk but the fact is that no one can take a cab across liverpool without having a quite complete and unified impression that the pathos is not a pathos of individual cases but a pathos in bulk people talk of the celtic sadness but there are very few things in ireland that look so sad as the irishman in liverpool the desolation of tara is cheery compared with the desolation of belfast i recommend mr yates and his mournful friends to turn their attention to the pathos of belfast i think if they hung up the harp that once in lord furnace's factory there would be a chance of another spring breaking broadly and as things bulk to the eye towns like leeds if placed beside towns like rouen or florence or chartres or cologne do actually look like beggars walking among burghers 
after that overpowering and unpleasant impression it is really useless to argue that they are richer because a few of their parasites get rich enough to live somewhere else the point may be put another way thus that it is not so much that these more modern cities have this or that monopoly of good or evil it is that they have every good in its fourth-rate form and every evil in its worst form for instance that interesting weekly paper the nation amiably rebuked mr belloc and myself for suggesting that revelry and the praise of fermented liquor were more characteristic of continental and catholic communities than of communities with the religion and civilization of belfast i said that if we would cross the border into scotland we should find out our mistake now not only have i crossed the border but i have had considerable difficulty in crossing the road in a scotch town on a festive evening men were literally lying like piled up corpses in the gutters and from broken bottles whiskey was pouring down the drains i am not likely therefore to attribute a total and arid abstinence to the whole of industrial scotland but i never said that drinking was a mark rather of the catholic countries i said that moderate drinking was a mark rather of the catholic countries in other words i say of the common type of continental citizen not that he is the only person who is drinking but that he is the only person who knows how to drink doubtless gin is as much a feature of hoxton as beer is a feature of munich but who is the connoisseur who prefers the gin of hoxton to the beer of munich doubtless the protestant scotch ask for scotch as the men of burgundy ask for burgundy but do we find them lying in heaps on each side of the road when we walk through a burgundian village do we find the french peasant ready to let burgundy escape down a drain pipe now this is one point on which i accept the nation's challenge it does not matter whether we are for alcohol or against it on either argument glasgow is more objectionable than rouen the french abstainer makes less fuss the french drinker gives less offence it is so with property with war with everything i can understand a teetotaler being horrified on his principles at italian wine drinking i simply cannot believe he could be more horrified at it than at hoxton gin drinking i can understand a pacifist with his special scruples disliking the militarism of belfort i flatly deny that he can dislike it any more than the militarism of berlin i can understand a good socialist hating the petty cares of the distributed peasant property i deny that any good socialist can hate them more than he hates the large cares of rockefeller that is the unique tragedy of the plutocratic state today it has no successes to hold up against the failures it alleges to exist in latin or other methods you can if you are well out of his reach call the irish rustic debased and superstitious i defy you to contrast his debasement and superstition with the citizenship and enlightenment of the english rustic today the rich man knows in his heart that he is a cancer and not an organ of the state he differs from all other thieves or parasites for this reason that the brigand who takes by force wishes his victims to be rich but he who wins by a one-sided contract actually wishes them to be poor rob roy in a cavern hearing a company approaching will hope or if in a pious mood pray that they may come laden with goods or gold but mr rockefeller in his factory knows that if those who pass are laden with goods they will pass on he will therefore if in a pious mood pray that they may be destitute and so be forced to work in his factory for him for a starvation wage it is said and also i believe disputed that blucher riding through the richer parts of london exclaimed what a city to sack but blucher was a soldier if he was a bandit the true sweater feels quite otherwise it is when he drives through the poorest parts of london that he finds the streets paved with gold being paved with prostrate servants it is when he sees the grey lean leagues of bow and poplar that his soul is uplifted and he knows he is secure this is not rhetoric but economics 
I repeat that up to a point the profiteer was innocent because he was ignorant. He had been lured on by easy and accommodating events. He was an innocent as the new thane of Glamis was an innocent, as the new thane of Cotter was an innocent. But the king, the modern manufacturer, like Macbeth, decided to march on under the mute menace of the heavens. He knew that the spoil of the poor was in his houses, but he could not, after careful calculation, think of any way in which they could get it out of his houses without being arrested for house-breaking. He faced the future with a face flinty with pride and impenitence. This period can be dated practically by the period when the old, genuine Protestant religion of England began to fail, and the average businessman began to be agnostic, not so much because he did not know where he was as because he wanted to forget. Many of the rich took to skepticism exactly as the poor took to drink, because it was a way out. But in any case, the man who had made a mistake not only refused to unmake it, but decided to go on making it. But in this he made yet another most amusing mistake, which was the beginning of all eugenics. End of chapter 3This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Eugenics and Other Evils by G. K. Chesterton Section 12, Part 2, The Real Aim Chapter 4, The Vengeance of the Flesh by a quaint paradox, we generally miss the meaning of simple stories, because we are not subtle enough to understand their simplicity. As long as men were in sympathy with some particular religion or other romance of things in general, they saw the thing solid and swallowed it whole, knowing that it could not disagree with them. But the moment men have lost the instinct of being simple in order to understand it, they have to be very subtle in order to understand it. We can find, for instance, a very good working case in those old puritanical nursery tales about the terrible punishment of trivial sins, about how Tommy was drowned for fishing on the Sabbath, or Sammy struck by lightning for going out after dark. Now these moral stories are immoral, because Calvinism is immoral. They are wrong because Puritanism is wrong but they are not quite so wrong, they are not a quarter so wrong, as many superficial sages have supposed. The truth is that everything that ever came out of a human mouth had a human meaning, and not one of the fixed fools of history was such a fool as he looks. And when our great-uncles or great-grandmothers told a child he might be drowned by breaking the Sabbath, their souls, though undoubtedly, as Touchstone said in a perilous state, were not in quite so simple a state as is suggested by supposing that their god was a devil who dropped babies into the Thames for a trifle. This form of religious literature is a morbid form, if taken by itself, but it did correspond to a certain reality in psychology which most people of any religion, or even of none, have felt a touch at some time or other. Leaving out theological terms as far as possible, it is the subconscious feeling that one can be wrong with nature as well as right with nature, that the point of wrongness may be a detail, in the superstitions of heathens this is often a triviality, but that if one is really wrong with nature there is no particular reason why all her rivers should not drown, or all her storm bolts strike one who is, by this vague yet vivid hypothesis, her enemy. This may be a mental sickness, but it is too human or too mortal a sickness to be called solely a superstition. It is not solely a superstition. It is not simply superimposed upon human nature by something that has got on top of it. 
it flourishes without check among non-christian systems and it flourishes especially in calvinism because calvinism is the most non-christian of christian systems but like everything else that inheres in the natural senses and spirit of man it has something in it that is not stark unreason it is an ill and it generally is it is one of the ills that flesh is heir to but he is the lawful heir and like many other dubious or dangerous human instincts or appetites it is sometimes useful as a warning against worse things now the trouble of the nineteenth century very largely came from the loss of this the loss of what we may call the natural and heathen mysticism when modern critics say that julius caesar did not believe in jupiter or that pope leo did not believe in catholicism they overlook an essential difference between those ages and ours perhaps julius did not believe in jupiter but he did not disbelieve in jupiter there was nothing in his philosophy or the philosophy of that age that could forbid him to think that there was a spirit personal and predominant in the world but the modern materialists are not permitted to doubt they are forbidden to believe hence while the heathen might avail himself of accidental omens queer coincidences or casual dreams without knowing for certain whether they were really hints from heaven or premonitory movements in his own brain the modern christian turned heathen must not entertain such notions at all but must reject the oracle as the altar the modern skeptic was drugged against all that was natural in the supernatural and this was why the modern tyrant marched upon his doom as a tyrant literally pagan might possibly not have done there is one idea of this kind that runs through most popular tales those for instance on which shakespeare is so often based an idea that is profoundly moral even if the tales are immoral it is what may be called the flaw in the deed the idea that if i take my advantage to the full i shall hear of something to my disadvantage thus midas fell into a fallacy about the currency and soon had a reason to become something more than a bimetallist thus macbeth had a fancy about forestry he could not see the trees for the wood he forgot that though a place cannot be moved the trees that grow on it can thus shylock had a fallacy of physiology he forgot that if you break into the house of life you find it a bloody house in the most emphatic sense but the modern capitalist did not read fairy tales and never looked for the little omens at the turnings of the road he or the most intelligent section of him had by now realized his position and knew in his heart it was a false position he thought a margin of men out of work was good for his business he could no longer really think it was good for his country he could no longer be the old hard-headed man who simply did not understand things he could only be the hard-hearted man who faced them but he still marched on he was sure he had made no mistake however he had made a mistake as definite as a mistake in multiplication it may be summarized thus that the same inequality and insecurity that makes cheap labor may make bad labor and at last no labor at all it was as if a man who wanted something from an enemy should at last reduce the enemy to come knocking at his door in the despair of winter should keep him waiting in the snow to sharpen the bargain and then come out to find the man dead upon the doorway he had discovered the divine boomerang his sin had found him out the experiment of individualism the keeping of the worker half in and half out of work was far too ingenious not to contain a flaw it was too delicate a balance to work entirely within the strength of the starved and the vigilance of the benighted it was too desperate a course to rely wholly on desperation and as time went on the terrible truth slowly declared itself the degraded class was really degenerating 
it was right and proper enough to use a man as a tool but the tool ceaselessly used was being used up it was quite reasonable and respectable of course to fling a man away like a tool but when it was flung away in the rain the tool rusted but the comparison to a tool was insufficient for an awful reason that had already begun to dawn upon the master's mind if you pick up a hammer you do not find a whole family of nails clinging to it if you fling away a chisel by the roadside it does not litter and leave a lot of little chisels but the meanest of the tools man had still this strange privilege which god had given him doubtless by mistake despite all improvements in machinery the most important part of the machinery the fittings technically described in the trade as hands were apparently growing worse the firm was not only encumbered with one useless servant but he immediately turned himself into five useless servants the poor should not be emancipated the old reactionaries used to say until they are fit for freedom but if this downrush went on it looked as if the poor would not stand high enough to be fit for slavery so at least it seemed doubtless in a great degree subconsciously to the man who had wagered all his wealth on the usefulness of the poor to the rich and the dependence of the rich on the poor the time came at last when the rather reckless breeding in the abyss below ceased to be a supply and began to be something like a wastage ceased to be something like keeping foxhounds and began alarmingly to resemble a necessity of shooting foxes the situation was aggravated by the fact that these sexual pleasures were often the only ones the very poor could obtain and were therefore disproportionately pursued and by the fact that their conditions were often such that prenatal nourishment and such things were utterly abnormal the consequences began to appear to a much less extent than the eugenists assert but still to a notable extent in a much looser sense than the eugenicists assume but still in some sort of sense the types that were inadequate or incalculable or uncontrollable began to increase under the hedges of the country on the seats of the parks loafing under the bridges or leaning over the embankment began to appear a new race of men men who are certainly not mad whom we shall gain no scientific light by calling feeble-minded but who are in varying individual degrees dazed or drink-sodden or lazy or tricky or tired in body and spirit in a far less degree than the teetotalers tell us but still in a large degree the traffic in gin and bad beer itself a capitalist enterprise fostered the evil though it had not begun it men who had no human bond with the instructed man men who seemed to him monsters and creatures without mind became an eyesore in the market-place and a terror on the empty roads the rich were afraid moreover as i have hinted before the act of keeping the destitute out of public life and crushing them under confused laws had an effect on their intelligences which paralyzes them even as a proletariat modern people talk of reason versus authority but authority itself involves reason or its orders would not even be understood if you say to your valet look after the buttons on my waistcoat he may do it even if you throw a boot at his head but if you say to him look after the buttons on my top hat he will not do it though you empty a boot shop over him if you say to a schoolboy write out that ode of horace from memory in the original latin he may do it without a flogging if you say write out that ode of horace in the original german he will not do it with a thousand floggings if you will not learn logic he certainly will not learn latin and the ludicrous laws to which the needy are subjected such as that which punishes the homeless for not going home have really i think a great deal to do with a certain increase in the sheepishness and short-wittedness and therefore in their industrial inefficiency 
by one of the monstrosities of the feeble-minded theory a man actually acquitted by judge and jury could then be examined by doctors as to the state of his mind presumably in order to discover by what diseased eccentricity he had refrained from the crime in other words when the police cannot jail a man who is innocent of doing something they jail him for being too innocent to do anything i do not suppose the man an idiot at all but i can believe he feels more like one after the legal process than before thus all the factors the bodily exhaustion the harassing fear of hunger the reckless refuge in sexuality and the black botheration of bad laws combined to make the employee more unemployable now it is very important to understand here that there were two courses of action still open to the disappointed capitalists confronted by the new peril of this real or alleged decay first he might have reversed his machine so to speak and started unwinding the long rope of dependency by which he had originally dragged the proletarian to his feet in other words he might have seen that the workman had more money more leisure more luxuries more status in the community and then trusted to the normal instincts of reasonably happy human beings to produce a generation better born bred and cared for than those tortured types that were less and less used to him it might still not be too late to rebuild the human house upon such an architectural plan that poverty might fly out the window with the reasonable prospect of love coming in at the door in short he might have let the english poor the mass of whom were not weak-minded though more of them were growing weaker a reasonable chance in the form of more money of archiving their eugenical resurrection themselves it has never been shown and it cannot be shown that the method would have failed but it can be shown and it must be closely and clearly noted that the method had very strict limitations from the employer's own point of view if they made the worker too comfortable he would not work to increase another's comforts if they made him too independent he would not work like a dependent if for instance his wages were so good that he could save out of them he might cease to be a wage earner if his house or garden were his own he might stand an economic siege in it the whole capitalist experiment had been built upon his dependence but now it was getting out of hand not in the direction of freedom but of frank helplessness one might say that his dependence had got independent of control but there was another way and towards this the employer's ideas began first darkly and unconsciously but now more and more clearly the drift giving property giving leisure giving status costs money but there is one human force that costs nothing as it does not cost the beggar a penny to indulge so it would not cost the employer a penny to employ he could not alter or improve the tables or the chairs on the cheap but there were two pieces of furniture labeled respectively the husband and the wife whose relations were much cheaper he could alter the marriage in the house in such a way as to promise himself the largest possible number of the kind of children he did want with the smallest possible number of the kind he did not he could divert the force of sex from producing vagabonds he could harness to his high engines unbought the red unbroken river of the blood of a man in his youth as he has already harnessed to them all the wild waste rivers of the world end of chapter four this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Eugenics and Other Evils by G. K. Chesterton Section 13 
Part Two, The Real Aim, Chapter Five, The Meanness of the Motive. Now, if any ask whether it be imaginable that an ordinary man of the wealthier type should analyze the problem or conceive the plan, the inhumanly far-seeking plan as I have set forth, the answer is certainly not. Many rich employers are too generous to do such a thing. Many are too stupid to know what they are doing. The eugenical opportunity I have described is but an ultimate analysis of a whole drift of thoughts in the type of man who does not analyze his thoughts. He sees a slouching tramp with a sick wife and a string of rickety children and honestly wonders what he can do with them. But the prosperity does not favor self-examination. And he does not even ask himself whether he means how can I help them or how can I use them. What he can still do for them or what they could still do for him. Probably he sincerely means both, but the latter much more than the former. He laments the breaking of the tools of mammon much more than the breaking of the images of God. It would be almost impossible to grope in the limbo of what he does think, but we can assert that there is one thing he does not think. He doesn't think this man might be as jolly as I am if he need not come to me for work or wages. That this is so that at the root the eugenicist is the employer. There are multitudinous proofs on every side, but they are of necessity miscellaneous and in many cases negative. The most enormous is, in a sense, the most negative, that no one seems able to imagine capitalist industrialism being sacrificed to any other object by a curious recurrent slip in the mind, as irritating as a catch in the clock, People miss the main thing and concentrate on the mean thing. Modern conditions are treated as fixed, though the very word modern implies they are fugitive. Old ideas are treated as impossible, though their very antiquity often proves their permanence. Some years ago some ladies petitioned that the platforms of our big railway station should be raised, as it was more convenient for the hobble skirt. It never occurred to them to change to a sensible skirt. Still less did it occur to him that, compared with all the female fashions that have fluttered about on it, by this time St. Pancras is as historic as St. Peter's. I could still fill this book with examples of the universal unconscious assumption that life and sex must live by the laws of business or industrialism, and not vice versa. Examples from all the magazines, novels, and newspapers. In order to make it brief and typical, I take one case of a more or less eugenist sort from a paper that lies open in front of me, a paper that still bears on its forehead the boast of being peculiarly an organ of democracy and revolt. To this a man writes to say that the spread of destitution will never be stopped until we have educated the lower classes in the methods by which the upper classes prevent procreation. The man had the horrible playfulness to sign his letter hopeful. Well, there are certainly many methods by which people in the upper classes prevent procreation. One of them is what used to be called platonic friendship, till they found another name for it at the Old Bailey. I do not suppose the hopeful gentleman hopes for this, but some of us find the abortion he does hope for almost as abominable. That, however, is not the curious point. The curious point is that the hopeful one concludes by saying, when people have large families and small wages, not only is there a high infantile death rate, but often those who do live to grow up are stunted and weakened by having had to share the family income for a time with those who died early. There would be less unhappiness if there were no unwanted children. You will observe that he tacitly takes it for granted that the small wages and the income desperately shared are the fixed points, like the day and night, the conditions of human life. Compared with them, marriage and maternity are luxuries, things to be modified to suit the wage market. There are unwanted children but unwanted by whom? 
This man does not really mean that the parents do not want to have them. He means that the employers do not want to pay them properly. Doubtless, if you said to him directly, Are you in favor of low wages? He would say no. But I am not in this chapter talking about the effect on such modern minds of a cross-examination to which they do not subject themselves. I am talking about the way their minds work, the instinctive trick and turn of their thoughts, the things they assume before the argument, and the way they faintly feel that the world is going. And frankly, the turn of their mind is to tell the child he is not wanted, as the turn of my mind is to tell the profiteer he is not wanted. Motherhood, they feel, and a full childhood, and the beauty of brothers and sisters are good things in their way, but not so good as a bad wage. About the mutilation of womanhood, and the massacre of men unborn, he signs himself hopeful. He is hopeful of female indignity, hopeful of human annihilation, but about improving the small bad wage, he signs himself hopeless. This is the first evidence of motive, the ubiquitous assumption that life and love must fit into a fixed framework of employment, even as in the case of bad employment. The second evidence is the tacit and total neglect of the scientific question in all the departments in which it is not an employment question, as, for instance, the marriages of the princely patrician or merely plutocratic houses. I do not mean, of course, that no scientific men have rigidly tackled these, though I do not recall any cases. But I am not talking of the merits of individual men of science, but of the push and power behind this movement, the thing that is able to make it fashionable and politically important. I say if this power were an interest in truth, or even in humanity, the first field in which to study would be in the weddings of the wealthy. Not only would the records be more lucid and the examples more in evidence, but the cases would be more interesting and more decisive, for the grand marriages have presented both extremes of the problem of pedigree, first the breeding in, and later the most incongruous cosmopolitan blends. It would really be interesting to note which worked the best, or what point of compromise was safest, for the poor, about whom the newspaper eugenists are always talking, cannot offer any test cases so complete. Waiters never had to marry waitresses, as princes had to marry princesses. And for the other extreme, housemaids seldom marry Red Indians. It may be because there are none to marry, but to the millionaires, the continents are flying railway stations, and the most remote races can be rapidly linked together. A marriage in London or Paris may chain Ravenna to Chicago, or Ben Cruchasen to Baghdad. Many European aristocrats marry Americans, curiously, the most mixed stock of the world, so that the disinterested eugenist, with a little trouble, might reveal rich stores of Negro or Asiatic blood to his delighted employer, instead of which he dulls our ears and distresses our refinement by tedious denunciations of the monochrome marriages of the poor. For there is something really pathetic about the eugenist neglect of the aristocrat and his family affairs. People still talk about the pride of pedigree, but it strikes me as the one point on which the aristocrats are most morbidly modest. We should be learned eugenists if we were allowed to know half as much of their heredity as we are of their hairdressing. We see the modern aristocrat in the most human poses in the illustrated papers playing with his dog or parrot, nay, we see him playing with his child or his grandchild, but there is something heart-rending in his refusal to play with his grandfather. There is often something vague and even fantastic about the antecedents of our most established families, which would afford the eugenist admirable scope not only for investigation but for experiment. Certainly, if he could obtain the necessary powers, the eugenist might bring off some startling effects with the mixed materials of the governing class. Suppose, to take wild and hypothetical examples, he were to marry a Scotch earl, say, to the daughter of a Jewish banker, or an English duke, or an American parvenu of semi-Jewish extraction. What would happen? We have here an unexplored field. It remains unexplored not merely through snobbery and cowardice, 
but because the eugenist at least the influential eugenist half consciously knows it is no part of his job what he is really wanted for is to get the grip of the governing classes on to the unmanageable output of the poor people it would not matter in the least if all lord cowdery's descendants grew up too weak to hold a tool or turn a wheel it would matter very much especially to lord cowdery if all his employees grew up like that the oligarch can be unemployable because he will not be employed thus the practical and popular exponent of eugenics has his face always turned towards the slums and instinctively thinks in terms of them if he talks of segregating some incurably vicious type of the sexual sort he is thinking of a ruffian who assaults girls in lanes he is not thinking of a millionaire like white the victim of thaw if he speaks of the hopeless or feeble-mindedness he is speaking of some stunted creature grasping at hopeless lessons in a poor school he is not thinking of a millionaire like thaw the slayer of white and this is not because he is such a brute as to like people like white or thaw any more than we do but because he knows that his problem is the degeneration of the useful classes because he knows that white would never have been a millionaire if all his workers had spent themselves on women as white did that thaw would never have been a millionaire if all his servants had been thaws the ornaments may be allowed to decay but the machinery must be mended that is the second proof of the plutocratic impulse behind all eugenics that no one thinks of applying it to the prominent classes no one thinks of applying it where it could most easily be applied a third proof is the strange new disposition to regard the poor as a race as if they were a colony of japanese or chinese coolies it can be most clearly seen by comparing it with the old more individualist charitable and as eugenists might say sentimental view of poverty in goldsmith or dickens or hood there is a basic idea that the particular poor person ought not to be so poor it is some accident or some wrong oliver twist or tiny tim are fairy princes waiting for their fairy godmother they are held as slaves but rather as the hero and heroine of a spanish or italian romance were held as slaves by the moors the modern poor are getting to be regarded as slaves in the separate and sweeping sense of the negroes in the plantations the bondage of the white hero to the black master was regarded as abnormal the bondage of the black to the white master as normal the eugenist for all i know would regard the mere existence of tiny tim as a sufficient reason for massacring the whole family of cratchit but as a matter of fact we have here a very good instance of how much more practically true to life is sentiment than cynicism the poor are not a race or even a type it is senseless to talk about breeding them for they are not a breed they are in cold fact what dickens describes a dustbin of individual accidents of damaged dignity and often of damaged gentility the class very largely consists of perfectly promising children lost like oliver twist or crippled like tiny tim it contains very valuable things like most dustbins but the eugenist delusion of the barbaric breed in the abyss affects even those more gracious philanthropists who almost certainly do want to assist the destitute and not merely to exploit them it seems to affect not only their minds but their very eyesight thus for instance mrs alec tweedy most almost scornfully asks when we go through the slums do we see beautiful children the answer is yes very often indeed i have seen children in the slums quite pretty enough to be little nell or the outcast whom hood called young and so fair nor has the beauty anything necessarily to do with health there are beautiful healthy children beautiful dying children ugly dying children ugly uproarious children in petticoat lane or park lane there are people of every physical and mental type of every sort of health and breeding in a single back street 
they have nothing in common but the wrong we do to them. The important point is, however, that there is more fact and realism in the wildest and most elegant fictions about disinherited dukes and long-lost daughters than there is in this eugenist attempt to make the poor all of a piece, a sort of black fungoid growth that is ceaselessly increasing in a chasm. There is a cheap sneer at poor landladies that they always say they have seen better days. Nine times out of ten they say it because it is true. What can be said of the great mass of Englishmen by anyone who knows any history except that they have seen better days? And a landlady's claim is not snobbish, but rather spirited. It is her testimony to the truth in the old tales of which I spoke, that she ought not to be so poor or so servile in status, that a normal person ought to have more property and more power in the state than that. Such dreams of lost dignity are perhaps the only things that stand between us and the cattle-breeding paradise now promised. Nor are such dreams by any means impotent. I remembered Mr. T. P. O'Connor wrote an interesting article about Madame Humbert, in the course of which he said that Irish peasants, and probably most peasants, tended to have a half-fictitious family legend about an estate to which they were entitled. This was written in the time when Irish peasants were landless in their land, and the delusion doubtless seemed all the more entertaining to the landlords who ruled them, and the money-lenders who ruled the landlords. But the dream has conquered the realities. The phantom farms have materialized, merely by tenaciously affirming the kind of pride that comes after a fall, by remembering the old civilization and refusing the new by recurring to an old claim that seemed to most Englishmen like the lie of a broken-down lodging-house keeper at Margate. By all this the Irish have got what they want in solid mud and turf. The imaginary estate has conquered the three estates of the realm. But the homeless Englishman must not even remember a home. So far from his house being his castle, he must not even have a castle in the air. He must have no memories. That is why he is taught no history, why he is told none of the truth about the medieval civilization, except a few cruelties and mistakes in chemistry. Why does a medieval burger never appear till he can appear in a shirt and a halter? Why does a medieval monastery never appear till it is corrupt enough to shock the innocence of Henry the Eighth? Why do we hear of the one charter, that of the barons, and not a word of the charters of the carpenters, smiths, shipwrights, and all the rest? The reason is that the English peasant is not only not allowed to have an estate, he is not even allowed to have lost one. The past has to be painted pitch black that it may be worse than the present. There is one strong, startling, outstanding thing about eugenics, and that is its meanness. Wealth and the social science supported by wealth had tried an inhuman experiment. The experiment had entirely failed. They sought to make wealth accumulate, and they made men decay. Then, instead of confessing the error and trying to restore the wealth, or attempting to repair the decay, they are trying to cover their first cruel experiment with a more cruel experiment. They put a poisonous plaster on a poisoned wound vilest of all, they actually quote the bewilderment produced among the poor by their first blunder as a reason for allowing them to blunder again. They are apparently ready to arrest all the opponents of their system as mad, merely because the system was maddening. Suppose a captain had collected volunteers in a hot waste country by the assurance that he could lead them to water and knew where to meet the rest of his regiment. Suppose he led them wrong, to a place where the regiment could not be for days, and there was no water. And suppose sunstroke struck them down on the sand, man after man, and they kicked and danced and raved. And when at last the regiment came, suppose the captain successfully concealed his mistake, because all his men had suffered too much from it to testify to its ever having occurred. What would you think of the gallant captain? It is pretty much what I think of this particular captain of industry. 
Of course, nobody supposes that all capitalists, or most capitalists, are conscious of any such intellectual trick. Most of them are as much bewildered as the battered proletariat. But there are some who are less well-meaning and more mean. These are leading their more generous colleagues towards the fulfillments of this ungenerous evasion, if not towards the comprehension of it. Now, a ruler of the capitalist civilization who has come to consider the idea of ultimately herding and breeding the workers like cattle has certain contemporary problems to review. He has to consider what forces still exist in the modern world for the frustration of his design. The first question is how much remains of the old ideal of individual liberty. The second question is how far the modern mind is committed to such egalitarian ideas as may be implied in socialism. The third is whether there is any power of resistance in the tradition of the populace itself. These three questions for the future I shall consider in their order in the final chapters that follow. It is enough to say here that I think the progress of these ideals has broken down at the precise point where they will fail to prevent the experiment. Briefly, the progress will have deprived the capitalist of his old individualist scruples without committing him to his new collectivist obligations. He is in a very perilous position, for he has ceased to be a liberal without becoming a socialist. And the bridge by which he was crossing has broken above an abyss of anarchy. End of chapter 5This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Eugenics and Other Evils by G. K. Chesterton Section 14 Part 2 The Real Aim Chapter 6 The Eclipse of Liberty if such a thing as the eugenic sociology had been suggested in the period from Fox to Gladstone, it would have been far more fiercely repudiated by the reformers than by the conservatives. If Tories had regarded it as an insult to marriage, radicals would have far more resolutely regarded it as an insult to citizenship. But in the interval we have suffered from a process resembling a sort of mystical parricide, such as is told of so many gods, and is true of so many great ideas. Liberty has produced skepticism, and skepticism has destroyed liberty. The lovers of liberty thought they were leaving it unlimited when they were only leaving it undefined. They thought they were only leaving it undefined when they were really leaving it undefended. Men, finding themselves free, found themselves free to dispute the value of freedom. But the important point to seize about this reactionary skepticism is that as it is bound to be unlimited in theory, so it is bound to be unlimited in practice. In other words, the modern mind is set in an attitude which would enable it to advance not only towards eugenic legislation, but towards any conceivable or inconceivable extravagances of eugenics. Those who reply to any plea for freedom invariably fall into a certain trap. I have debated with numberless different people on these matters, and I confess I find it amusing to see them tumbling into it one after another. I remember discussing it before a club of very active and intelligent suffragists, and I cast it here for convenience in the form which it there assumed. Suppose, for the sake of argument, that I say that to take away a poor man's pot of beer is to take away a poor man's personal liberty. It is very vital to note what is the usual or almost universal reply. People hardly ever do reply for some reason or another by saying that a man's liberty consists of such and such things, but that beer is an exception that cannot be classed among them for such and such reasons. What they almost invariably do say is something like this. After all, what is liberty? 
man must live as a member of society and must obey those laws which etc etc in other words they collapse into a complete confession that they are attacking all liberty and any liberty that they do deny the very existence of the very possibility of liberty in the very form of the answer they admit the full scope of the accusation against them in trying to rebut the smaller accusation they plead guilty to the larger one this distinction is very important as can be seen from any practical parallel suppose we wake up in the middle of the night and find that a neighbor has entered the house not by the front door but by the skylight we may suspect that he has come after the fine old family jewelry we may be reassured if he can refer it to a really exceptional event such as that he fell onto the roof out of an aeroplane or climbed onto the roof to escape from a mad dog short of the incredible the stranger the story the better the excuse for an extraordinary event requires an extraordinary excuse but we shall hardly be reassured if he merely gazes at us in a dreamy and wistful fashion and says after all what is property why should material objects be thus artificially attached etc etc we shall merely realize that his attitude allows of his taking the jewelry and everything else or if the neighbor approaches us carrying a large knife dripping with blood we may be convinced by his story that he killed another neighbor in self-defense that the quiet gentleman next door was really a homicidal maniac we shall know that the homicidal mania is exceptional and that we ourselves are so happy as not to suffer from it and being free from the disease may be free from the danger but it will not soothe us for the man with the gory knife to say softly and pensively after all what is human life why should we cling to it brief at best sad at the brightest it is itself but a disease from which etc etc we shall perceive that the skeptic is in a mood not only to murder us but to massacre everybody in the street exactly the same effect which would be produced by the question of what is property and what is life is produced by the question of what is liberty it leaves the questioner free to disregard any liberty or in other words to take any liberties the very thing he says is an anticipatory excuse for anything he may choose to do if he gags a man to prevent him from indulging in profane swearing or locks him in the coal cellar to guard against his going on the spree, he can still be satisfied with saying, after all, what is liberty? Man is a member of, etc., etc. That is a problem, and that is why there is now no protection against eugenic or any other experiments. If the man who took away beer as an unlawful pleasure had paused for a moment to define the lawful pleasures, there might be a different situation. If the man who had denied one liberty had taken the opportunity to affirm other liberties, there might be some defense for them. But it never occurs to them to admit any liberties at all. It never so much as crosses their minds. Hence the excuse for the last oppression will always serve as well for the next oppression, and to that tyranny there can be no end. Hence the tyranny has taken but a single stride to reach the secret and sacred places of personal freedom, where no sane man ever dreamed of seeing it, and especially the sanctuary of sex. It is as easy to take away a man's wife or baby as to take away his beer when you can say, what is liberty? Just as it is as easy to cut off his head and to cut off his hair if you are free to say, what is life? There is no rational philosophy of human rights generally disseminated among the populace to which we can appeal in defense of even the most intimate or individual things that anyone can imagine. For so far as there was a vague principle in these things, that principle has been wholly changed. It used to be said that a man could have liberty so long as it did not interfere with the liberty of others. This did afford some rough justification for the ordinary legal view of the man with the pot of beer. For instance, it was logical to allow some degree of distinction between beer and tea, 
on the ground that a man may be moved by excess of beer to throw the pot at someone's head. And it may be said that the spinster is seldom moved by excess of tea to throw the teapot at anyone's head. But the whole ground of argument is now changed, for people do not consider what the drunkard does to others by throwing the pot, but what he does to himself by drinking the beer. The argument is based on health, and it is said that the government must safeguard the health of the community. And the moment that is said, there ceases to be the shadow of a difference between beer and tea. People can certainly spoil their health with tea, or with tobacco, or with twenty other things, and there is no escape for the hygienic logician except to restrain and regulate them all. If he is to control the health of the community, he must necessarily control all the habits of all the citizens, and among the rest their habits in the matter of sex. But there is more than this. It is not only true that it is the last liberties of man that are being taken away, and not merely his first or most superficial liberties. It is also inevitable that the last liberty should be taken first. It is inevitable that the most private matter should be the most under public coercion. This inverse variation is very important, though very little realized. If a man's personal health is a public concern, his most private acts are more public than his most public acts. The official must deal more directly with his cleaning his teeth in the morning than with his using his tongue in the marketplace. The inspector must interfere more with how he sleeps in the middle of the night than with how he works in the course of the day. The private citizen must have much less to say about his bath or his bedroom window than about his vote or his banking account. The policeman must be in a new sense a private detective, and shadow him in private affairs rather than in public affairs. A policeman must shut doors behind him for fear he should sneeze, or shove pillows under him for fear he should snore. All this and things far more fantastic follow from the simple formula that the state must make itself responsible for the health of the citizen. But the point is that the policeman must deal primarily and promptly with the citizen in his relation to his home, and only indirectly and more doubtfully with the citizen in his relation to his city. By the whole logic of this test, the king must hear what is said in the inner chamber, and hardly notice what is proclaimed from the housetops. We have heard of a revolution that turns everything upside down. But this is almost literally a revolution that turns everything inside out. If a wary reactionary of the tradition of Metternich had wished in the nineteenth century to reverse the democratic tendency, he would naturally have begun by depriving the democracy of its margin of more dubious powers over the distant things. He might well begin, for instance, by removing the control of foreign affairs from popular assemblies. And there is a case for saying that a people may understand its own affairs without knowing anything whatever about foreign affairs. Then he might centralize great national questions, leaving a great deal of local government in local questions. This would proceed so far for a long time before it occurred to the blackest terrorist of the despotic ages to interfere with a man's own habits in his own house. But the new sociologists and legislators are, by the nature of their theory, bound to begin where the despots leave off, even if they leave off where the despots begin. For them, as they would put it, the first things must be the very fountain of life, love and birth, and babyhood. And these are always covered fountains flowing in the quiet courts of the home. For them, as Mr. H. G. Wells put it, Life itself may be regarded merely as a tissue of births. Thus they are coerced by their own rational principle to begin all coercion at the other end, at the inside end. What happens to the outside end, the external and remote powers of the citizen? They do not very much care. And it is probable that the democratic institution of recent centuries 
will be allowed to decay in undisturbed dignity for a century or two more. Thus our civilization will find itself in an interesting situation, not without humor, in which the citizen is still supposed to wield imperial powers over the ends of the earth, but has admittedly no power over his own body and soul at all. He will still be consulted by politicians about whether opium is good for Chinamen, but not about whether ale is good for him. He will be cross-examined for his opinions about the danger of allowing Kamasatka to have a war fleet, but not about allowing his own child to have a wooden sword. About all he will be consulted about the delicate diplomatic crisis created by the proposed marriage of the Emperor of China, and not allowed to marry as he pleases. Part of this prophecy, or probability, has already been accomplished. The rest of it, in the absence of any protest, is in process of accomplishment. It would be easy to give an almost endless catalogue of examples to show how, in dealing with the poorer classes at least, coercion has already come near to a direct control of the relations of the sexes. But I am much more concerned in this chapter to point out that all these things have been adopted in principle, even where they have not been adopted in practice. It is much more vital to realize that the reformers have possessed themselves of a principle which will cover all such things if it be granted, and which is not sufficiently comprehended to be contradicted. It is a principle whereby the deepest things of the flesh and spirit must have the most direct relationship with the dictatorship of the state. They must have it by the whole reason and rationale upon which the thing depends. It is a system that might be symbolized by the telephone from headquarters standing by a man's bed. He must have a relation to government like his relation to God. That is, the more he goes into the inner chambers and the more he closes the doors, the more he is alone with the law. The social machinery, which makes such a state uniform and submissive, will be worked outwards from the household as from a handle or a single mechanical knob or button. In a horrible sense, loaded with fear and shame, and every detail of dishonor, it will be true to say that charity begins at home. Charity will begin at home in the sense that all home children will be like charity children. Philanthropy will begin at home, for all householders will be like paupers. Police administration will begin at home, for all citizens will be like convicts, and when health and the humors of daily life have passed into the domain of this social discipline, when it is admitted that the community must primarily control the primary habits, when all laws begin, so to speak, next to the skin or nearest the vitals, then indeed it will appear absurd that marriage and maternity should not be similarly ordered then indeed it will seem to be illogical, and it will be illogical, that love should be free when life has lost its freedom. So passed to all appearance from the minds of men the strange dream and fantasy called freedom. Whatever be the future of these evolutionary experiments and their effect on civilization, there is one land at least that has something to mourn. For us in England, something will have perished which our fathers valued all the more because they hardly troubled to name it and whatever be the stars of a more universal destiny the great star of our night has set the english had missed many other things that men of the same origins had achieved or retained not to them was given like the french to establish eternal communes with clear codes of equality not to them, like the southern Germans, to keep the popular culture of their songs. Not to them, like the Irish, was it given to die daily for a great religion. But a spirit had been with them from the first, which fenced, with a hundred quaint customs and legal fictions, the way of a man who wished to walk nameless and alone. It was not for nothing that they forgot all their laws to remember the name of an outlaw, and filled the green heart of England with the figure of Robin Hood. It was not for nothing that even their princes of art and letters had about them 
something of king's incognito undiscovered by formal or academic fame so that no eye can follow the young shakespeare as he came up the green lanes from stratford or the young dickens when he first lost himself among the lights of london it is not for nothing that the very roads are crooked and capricious so that a man looking down on a map like a snaky labyrinth could tell that he was looking on the home of a wandering people a spirit at once wild and familiar rested upon its woodlands like a wind at rest if that spirit be indeed departed it matters little that it has been driven out by perversions it had itself permitted by monsters it had idly let loose industrialism and capitalism and the rage for physical science were english experiments in the sense that the english lent themselves to their encouragement but there was something else behind them and within them that was not they its name was liberty and it was our life it may be that this delicate and tenacious spirit has at last evaporated if so it matters little what becomes of the external experiments of our nation in later time that at which we look will be a dead thing alive with its own parasites the english will have destroyed england End of section 14.